This is a Singer 127 from 1922 that I'm going to be doing up for a friend. Uh, you can see she's a little dirty, but uh, before we start on her, I want to just take a good look at the machine and see what she needs, what she doesn't need, and what she needs is a lot more than what she doesn't, that's for certain. But anyway, I just want to evaluate the machine a little bit before we go on. Uh, we'll start on the bottom. Let me make sure you can see that well enough. Okay. As you can see, she's pretty dirty down here. There's a lot of grime. You can probably scrape a lot of that off. Yeah, it's a lot of old oil and grime that's on the mechanism all the way around. Uh, the shuttle carrier is there. It doesn't look like it has a bobbin in it, or a bobbin, or, or I say a shuttle in it, but the carrier is intact. The linkages on these are pretty simple. Let me and oh yeah it's gummed up it's gummed up real bad so we know we're going to be doing a lot of cleaning down below and uh we take the front end of it off and take a look and see what's inside the nose of this the nose piece of this get the screws out She's going to be spending a day, at least a full day, on the healing bench getting cleaned on the inside. I can tell that already. Oh, yeah. Let me put these in a safe spot. All right. The needle bar, it's got a lot of grime and crud on it. The, uh, well, the presser bar is functioning. It's, oh. Yeah, it doesn't go down very quickly. That's very grimed up. That's going to all have to come out and get polished. But at least the upper thread tension does seem to be releasing. Oh, the amount of dirt in there is disgusting. Yeah, that's all going to have to come apart. And nothing seems to be seized. That's looking good. Now for the pièce de résistance. One slide comes out. Oh, you can get them both. Shocking. Usually the back slides are uh, pretty nasty, pretty gnarly. That's pretty disgusting. That's pretty disgusting. Might be able to salvage these. I might replace these with new. Um, so yeah, take a quick peek around the back side. Ugh, this is gross. This is gross. Yeah, a lot of schmoo in there as well. This is going to be a case of release the schmoo. That is for certain. And I see the bobbin, ca uh, the the uh, shuttle itself is gone. No matter, I've got another one I can put in there. Yeah, she'll clean up. The decals aren't great, but they'll they look pretty good. Yeah, I think a lot of cleaning and a lot of oil, and then we'll polish the hell out of her. And. Uh, make her look nice and pretty but this machine is going to my good friend Sonia and the other part of another part of the country oh yeah that's schmooey as well all right well let me reset and uh well, that's free reset and I'll get a couple of parts off and I'll show you some of the cleaning process all right, I pulled a couple of more parts off her. I took her hand wheel off, her bobbin winder off, and uh, the back the back cover. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take off the feed dogs. There's this, this screw right here. Fortunately, with all this oil and goo on here, it's it's prevented it from rusting. And you know, rust is our enemy. So get that. Sh screw out, put that my little parts thing, and yeah, the feed dogs still feel sharp, so I think that's just going to be a cleaning, just to get that out of the way, and the next step we're going to do, let just confirm framing here so you can see that, alright, we're going to take the uh, presser bar out first, before I do that, I'm going to take off the thread cutter, which just slides down. Oh yeah, that's dull. And remove, if it wants to come off. Come on there, baby. Come on. Oh, this is covered in schmoo. 
my hands are going to be filthy. And come on. Insert elevator music here while I fight with this. And it's coming. Put something on there. Cut through a little bit of that schmoo. Stick a little arrow coil into that. Arrow coil, great stuff. It's good penetrating lubricant. We'll run it back in a little bit. There it goes. It's coming out now. All right, I'm going to have to let that sit for a second. I'll bring you back when I've got that off. Okay, the arrow coil has done its magic. And the presser foot adjuster is coming off now. You see the slight spring up. Oh yeah, that doesn't want to budge. There's a little washer underneath there. Let's see if I can get a pick in there and get that to loosen up a little bit. No, it's not going to loosen. So what we'll do is plan two is bigger screwdriver on the uh, the way the mechanism works is that this, this, this block here engages with the lifter lever and there's a set screw here which I'm going to take out completely and on the side of the block there's a little teeny screw which applies pressure this block on the, where it rides through the, through the body is slit and it's drilled and tapped in the middle of that for this little teeny set screw which applies outward pressure to the block so it doesn't rattle around little tiny screw it's going to go in my little parts again all right so seeing how we can't get the spring to cooperate that way we're going to try another method on this using a little advanced tapiology so, with the block, it's kind of sticking. I'm just going to put a little punch on that, tap it a little. Actually, we're going to hold that up. Uh, here, I'm going to cram that pocket knife handle under there. So, I've got a little bit of travel available. And just tap down. There. And the block is moving downward now. See, it's moving. And stick a larger block of wood in there. Oops, there we go. There. It's moving on the schmoo now. And now I should be able to. Yeah, there we go. That's kind of nasty looking. We can now extract the spring and the block comes out. So now we have all that good stuff. We'll take our screwdriver and we will remove the screw. Come on baby, you can get out of there. There we go. And we now have the lifter bar. All right, let me get some stuff out of the way here. Spring in there so we don't lose it. And let's take a look around on this side. All right, check framing and focus real quick. Okay. Next part that's going to come out is going to be the take-up arm. Ah, good. It wasn't as bad as I had feared. And it comes out. We might have to move this around a little bit to get it to disengage. There we go. And out it comes. And that is just filthy, vile, and disgusting. I'll do some close-ups of those parts before we start cleaning them so you can see how schmooey this machine really is. And next step, we'll take off the upper thread tension which is equally disgusting and we'll take it apart on the machine first 
Oh yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Gross. And screw out, spring out. Yeah, that's gross. Yeah, that is vile. Absolutely vile. Okay. All right. Uh, give me a second to clean some stuff up here. I'll be right back. Okay, before we go any further, before I even take the rest of this uh, assembly out for the upper thread tension, I want to take out the needle bar. There's a thread guide by the needle bar clamp that's got to come off to get this out. So a little trick I do is I put a nice little magnet on a screwdriver. It helps both getting them off and getting them back on. It's real easy to strip the threads out on the needle bar. Ask me how I know. Anyway, then off comes the, the clamp. And let's get this back in frame. Swing it around. Alright, you should still be able to see that. On the needle bar itself, there are two screws. One is a set screw, one is a clamping screw. So what we're going to do first is we're going to take the set screw off. Being very careful. We got it. We're going to pull the set screw. Well, it's not really a set screw. It's actually a screw screw, but it functions as a set screw. And I'm going to stick that, because it's very similar to another one. I'm going to stick these screws into a separate little parts container so I don't mix them up. And then take the clamping screw off. All right. Clamping screw is off. Now the needle bar. Oh! We have luck. Needle bar came out. It is filthy as it all get out, but at least it came out. That screw there actually goes through this uh, hole in the shaft and sets the needle bar height properly. Now we can also, much easier, remove this little spring off the back of the thread tensioning assembly. And we'll dig into that a little bit deeper. Swing this around. Up we go. Trying to do this and stay out of your line of sight. It's not the easiest thing to do. But we'll give it a try. Hopefully you can still see what I'm working on here. To get the actuating bar that where, that where the lifter comes up for the, um, for the uh, presser bar, it reaches over this this pivots and reaches over and hits the pin on the upper thread mechanism get these screwdrivers out of the way there's a little hole back here I don't know if that's a screw or a pin it feels like it's a pin uh, it is a pin so we're going to leave that in place for the moment. I'll decide whether I'm going to try to remove that or if I'm going to clean it in place. But take off the cam for the needle bar so we can clean that as well. And that's about as far down as we're going to strip that we'll take the bearing off too that runs on, the, that, runs on that. And that's about as far down as we're going to strip that at the moment. I'm going to come back to that later. And let's swing around the back side. The, the stitch length adjuster seems to be working pretty freely. I'm sure you've all heard the expression, discretion is the better part of valor. Uh, this screw does not want to budge. This machine is 98 years old, and I don't want to take a chance of damaging it. Um, a little bit of croil on the adjuster screw got this moving nice and smoothly so I'm gonna leave that alone I don't always take everything completely apart and I can clean this knob and polish it real nice with it fully extended out of the machine without take, do, taking any chances of doing any damage to the body of the machine or its decals so I'm gonna leave that be um, I see no sense in taking any chances whatsoever 
of damaging anything, especially for machines that this old. I don't like to have to go chasing down replacement parts if I don't have to. And I think this one will be okay. And uh, actually getting all the stuff out of the, the left end of the box has freed this up a little bit. So it's going to be time for just a little bit of routine cleaning. And I'll come back and show you what it looks like after a little bit more cleaning has been done. Okay, one more piece is going to come off before I dive into the deschmuification. I'm going to take the shuttle carrier off. And that is simply one screw here. Now, there is an adjustment for this for length, which we'll be getting into on the reassembly. I have to spin that a little bit to free it out. There we go. And that, too, is filthy. Um, when I didn't have the camera running, I did remove the stud and the spring from um, the upper thread tension. Uh, I was looking at this and trying to figure out how best to handle it, and I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to clean these the, the schmooey stuff off of these parts in place rather than completely disassembling this. I don't think it's really necessary to take it apart. I think I can get everything pretty clean without doing so. Uh, everything that's in this bin and those screws there and a lot of other stuff that's just really grimy is going to go into the ultrasonic cleaner for a little while with uh, some um, uh, hot water, well it's a, it's a heated ultrasonic cleaner but it's going to go in there with a, a solution of simple green and water and it'll sit in there for a while just to get the, the grime off of it uh, and it's still all going to get polished too and I don't know if I'm going to use the Dremel or if I'm going to use the flexible shaft tool to do the polishing yet or not but uh, anyway, so that's about as far down as I'm going to take her. I, like I said, I decided to leave the uh, stitch length adjustment screw in there. Um, but she's, she's down pretty good. Um, so I'm going to get to cleaning. And when I see something interesting in the cleaning process, oh, hell, I'll show you now. There's a couple of things you should know. Let me make sure I got this in camera. And I do not. Let me just a little minor camera adjustment here. And this camera does not autofocus on zoom. So hopefully the focus is clear. All right. Inside the head, on this side, there is a groove that runs the whole length of the side here. Part of the groove is actually cut through as a slot. What that is for. This cam follower, which goes, which has this little bearing and moves the needle bar up and down, this tab rides in that groove. So that's got to be spotless. This has to be spotless and polished. And there's one more little part here that's involved with that. And that is the clamp that goes, let me pull it out of my parts box here, the clamp that, that attaches to the, to the uh, presser bar. You can see here, I hope you can see here, it's got that hole. That's where that little tiny set screw is. And you can see how it's slit the whole length of it. And that set screw actually puts outward pressure. That rides in the slotted portion of that where that groove is. And that is what guides the presser bar. So, anywho, wanted to show you that real quick before I take the shmoo off this. Oh yes, I did get that little washer out that's up there. It was just covered, it was just, I had to take a screwdriver and push it back down and bring it out this side. It was just so covered in goo, it did not want to move. So anyway, let me get some cleaning done and I'll come back and show you the, what happened. All right, it's about six, seven minutes later, maybe 10 minutes later. The parts that went into the ultrasonic are out, rinsed in hot water and dried. Now I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the ultrasonic for a couple seconds. The uh, one that I use is the relatively inexpensive Harbor Freight ultrasonic. I believe it's a two liter capacity 
It costs somewhere in the neighborhood of $70 or so, something like that. I don't know what the actual price is, um, but go to their website, Harbor Freight, and uh, you can see if there's any deals going on now or not. But um, it is a popular little unit. It's not the most powerful one in the world, but it does get the job done. I actually bought mine for doing motorcycle parts. Um, I have a couple of uh, 1983 Honda Goldwings, and I had a uh, rear master cylinder that I had to rebuild, and it was filthy, so I bought that little ultrasonic, popped it in there, took two or three runs to get all that crap off, but she came up sparkling, put a new rebuild kit in it, and she was great. But anyway, she does work well on sewing machine parts too. The majority of the schmoo is off. Um, like I said, I use a uh, about a 10, 15, maybe 20% solution. It's not scientific, it's not exact, of uh, simple green and water. I use warm water from the tap. And um, for all these little tiny small screws, what I did was I took this parts bin, which actually came out of one of this style parts boxes. Once again, a Harbor Freight item. And uh, the bigger chunks went in in the basket down into the, uh, to the um, ultrasonic cleaner. But all these little screws I left in here and I slowly submerged it so it filled up with water. That way they didn't get lost. And when I was rinsing, likewise when I was rinsing these small screws, um, I have a funnel probably about six inches in diameter and I cut a, about a, an eight inch square piece of window screen, plastic window screen. I put that, uh, pretty fine window screen I might add, put that into the funnel and then when I dumped this out I dumped it in the funnel and then ran in hot water over it under the sink so I didn't lose any of these little tiny screws because like I said before some of these like this one here you lose it and you are literally screwed. But anyway um, everything has got uh, rinsed off with hot water and padded dry and um, I'm going to put these back in a bin for uh, while I work on cleaning the rest of the mechanism but I wanted to show you this um, that it did come out looking considerably better they're not polished but the worst of the grime is off I could have run it another another pass through the ultrasonic the only bad thing about the Harbor Freight one is you can only run it for a maximum, I think it's 15 minutes before you got to let it rest for about an hour. Like I said, it's an inexpensive one, but it does do a really nice job. Um, definitely good enough for what we're doing here, cleaning sewing machine parts. So um, that's about that. it on the ultrasonic, and I will bring you back when I'm ready for some more action here. Okay, having looked at this a little closer, there is a couple more pieces I'm going to take off. At least one more piece is coming off. I'm going to take off the uh, piece that moves the shuttle arm back and forth. There's a lock screw here that clamps down. It's not a lock screw, it's actually a clamping screw. Uh, put the right side of the screwdriver on it. So I'm going to loosen that. And I've already loosened these. Remove this screw. These I'm not going to put in the ultrasonic. I'm just going to clean these local. And then remove this is this off. I, I'm taking this off because this is really gummed up. You can see the amount of schmoo and gum in here. And this is just so sticky. This is never going to operate smoothly unless I take it apart and clean it. So that's why that came off. Okay. Um, I got to thinking after I got the stuff cleaned up and I start looking at other parts. I can't do a less than perfect job for a machine I'm giving to a friend, or for anybody for that matter. You know, when you put, when you do something and you put your name on it, you want it to be right. So I'm taking the whole mechanism apart. But what I'm going to do is I'm doing it smart. Uh, I'm taking one component off at a time cleaning it, degreasing it, it'll go back on. Uh, some, I'm not doing the internal parts because that one screw, I don't want to take a chance of damaging. That will just get flooded with kerosene to clean it out. 
but I'm taking one part off at a time, then it can go back on, lube back in position. That way everything gets cleaned. I, I discovered when I picked this up, the back of this was just caked with schmoo and gunk and grime. I'm like, no, 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 no. Um, can't go out that way. So it's going to be a little bit of an involved process. There are some adjustments that have to be made to get these things to work right. So that's why I'm doing it one piece at a time, taking it off and then putting it back on. Um, but anyway, you'll you'll see it in uh, you'll see the end result. Just to give you a little hint, you can see how gross this is. That's got to come out and get cleaned. All right. One thing I have to stress, if you're going to take one of these machines down this far, or farther, um, unless you've done it a lot and are familiar with that specific machine, do yourself a huge favor and find the adjuster's manual before you start tackling it. Um, there are places that where there are subtle adjustments which you might not think there are. Uh, for example, in this arm that controls the uh, motion of the feed dogs, this is this bolt coming through is not a bolt. It's actually an eccentric, meaning the shaft is the, the head and the shaft are turned, but the area that's threaded there's also a shoulder. And let me see if I can find something I can point to. And it's slightly off center. So when this is in place. Here, I'll, I'll just turn it. Hopefully you can see what it's doing. It's going around in a different orbit. It's not just straight out of the shaft. That's actually an adjustment on the feed dog mechanism. So that's why it's important to have the adjuster's manual, and it's important to understand how the specific machine is going to work before you start taking apart, or you're going to wind up paying somebody a bunch of extra money to fix it. All right, the bottom is back together again. There is a couple of adjustments that'll have to be made once the top is put back together. Um, the astutely observant of you will notice that I had put this bar in upside down earlier. Duh, it happens. Um, but unfortunately, when you do that, it rubs against these two, uh, well, at least this rib of the mechanism and kind of locks things up. And I just have my, my, my one little uh, duh moment for the day. So anyway, um, I've got the rest of the machine, the upper portions, the mechanism is now soaking in kerosene internally. I injected a little bit of that in there and I'm just letting that loosen up the crud. So for now I'm going to sign off and I will come back later on today. Here's a quick tip. Uh, for cleaning the track in the head that the take-up bar moves, get yourself some of these wide cotton swabs and just slowly turn it. You have to soak the stuff down in some oil first, but slowly turn it around and you can scrub it. You see all the schmoo that comes out. And yeah, once again, scrub all this other stuff too. You might need to use a few cotton swabs, but that's, a, that's the way I get into that track and clean it out because there's a bearing on the uh, take-up arm that rides in that track. So you want to make sure that that's good and clean. Here's another little handy tip. These tracks that the slides go on, you can de-rust them by putting a little bit, well, that was a lot of it, of sewing machine oil on one of these flexible nail file thingies. You get these at Sally's Beauty. And just polish that up a little bit. And likewise on the other side, get some, pick some of that oil up. Just get the surface rust on there. Now this is actually a dovetailed shape. It actually goes inward. You're not gonna be able to get in there that way. So I use a little pick and I get in there as long as it's got some oil on it, use the point of the pick 
and that'll knock out a lot of the schmoo. I think that got it pretty much. We'll just uh, take a hunk of paper towel and wipe that out and see how much dirt we... Oh yeah, we got some dirt out of there from that. Yep, picked out the dirt. Now, I haven't worked on any of the metal pieces yet, but to give you an example, uh, let me find the correct slide piece. Uh, this is the front, oh god, this is disgusting. But these front slides, these are also tapered. And they're tapered, this is the top of it, it's tapered that way. Yeah, they're both tapered in the same direction. Once again, you can clean those surfaces. You can, you can feel when it's riding the, when it's riding correctly on it. And you can clean these off with a nail file. But we're gonna, we're gonna take a little bit more drastic action on this anyway. We're gonna soak this stuff in vapor rust to get a lot of the surface rust off of it but i just wanted to show you that so that'll allow it to get in there slide it oh that's moving nicely right now just when cleaning the other tracks the other one was a little sticky let's see how that one's doing yeah it's still a little sticky but i didn't touch this yet so anyway yeah just a little bit of a nail these these, these flexible nail files they this particular one has four grits on it I'm not sure exactly what the grits are. I use these a lot for polishing other metal parts, which you'll see later on when we get to, to like the presser foot and stuff. But you can get that surface clean. You can get it clean and shiny. And the back one should be able to have a little resistance. So that's actually pretty good. Yeah, so that's that's about the way you want it to move. Because you don't want the, the uh, fabric pulling that through. All right. Let me get back to polishing the rest of this beast. It's coming along. It's almost there. Okay. Uh, before we get into the rest of the polishing, there's one piece that I have already reinstalled, and that is the shuttle carrier. Uh, I've already done the, the, the testing on this uh, for the measurement. So it was a bit of a pain in the neck. You have to use a feeler gauge and measure certain spots for the clearance with the uh, shuttle all the way in the rear position. There's a couple of spots where you have to measure. So you have to have 18 thousandths of an inch clearance between the shuttle and the casting. Now, of course, I cleaned the inside of this casting really well. The shutter, shuttle carrier is clean. It is a new shuttle that's in it. It's a correct shuttle. It's not a reproduction. It is a, it's a genuine Singer part. Um, and everything is spotlessly clean. When I put everything together, it was lubricated. But um, anyway, that is set. I will show you where the adjustment screw is. Once I get the shuttle out. Actually, let me turn this sideways. Okay. And lay her back on her back. Make sure you can see the screw. Okay, you can. The screw here, which we removed when we pulled the shuttle carrier out, this big and back here, once you, you, when you put the shuttle carrier back in, um, you kind of get it ballpark in position and you just put this mildly snug and after you go through the alignment procedures, then you crank that down and it's ready to go. All right, next up is polishing all the fiddly little bits that go internal and then we can do the final assembly and adjustment. Okay, time to start cleaning some parts. We're going to start off with the block for the presser bar lifter using a rotary tool with uh, a scotch bright pad. Gets most of the schmoo off first. I got a lot of it off earlier, but I'm just going to clean it up a little bit. You want to be careful how you do this. You don't want to take too much material off. You just want to get the schmoo. All right. All right, that looks pretty good. I want to polish that surface, though. So, we grab a bucking wheel. I warn you, you're going to want to use, uh, you're going to want to wear an apron or you're going to just get filthy with this. I'm using a cloth wheel on a rotary tool. 
This is a white Dico buffing compound. Just charge that up a little bit. And I want to buff these surfaces here. The nice and clean and shiny. You get a little more compound on there. Okay. I don't want any burrs. I want this to be nice and shiny, nice and clean. Okay, because this is the portion. Turn that off so you can hear me better. This is the portion that rides in the slot on the machine. Uh, that one, one down. And let's take the take-up arm. Same thing. We'll just take. We'll just do this with the with the compound. You get the idea. It's a laborious process. Make sure you get the bearing surfaces too. Get them nice and clean and shiny. This is a bearing surface. This is a pivoting bearing surface here. Want that nice and clean. Actually, I need to turn this down a little bit. That's a little too fast. A little more compound on there. We're gonna do the entire part, not just the parts that can be parts portions of it that can be seen. We're gonna do the entire part because we can. Now I like working with a block of wood because some of these parts are a little oddball shape, and uh, supporting it on a block of wood allows you to get the area where you're working on generally pretty flat. You gotta also watch out, these things are gonna get awfully warm too. So you might wanna go back and forth between multiple parts while you're doing it so you don't burn your fingers. Ask me how I know that. We do all the surfaces just to get the schmoo and the grime and the old oil and crud off. Get it nice and polished up. Yeah, and that can hurt. Okay. Grab another part here while that's cooling off a little bit. Here, yeah, this is nice and nasty looking. Let's make this look nice. Start with the working portions of it. I like to choke up a little bit on the tool sometimes too. If you're going to do a machine for somebody else, or for yourself, whatever, 
If you're going to do a machine, you might as well do it right. You might as well make it pretty. These machines were gorgeous when they came out of the factory, and there's no reason why we can't make them gorgeous again. These, these parts generally don't wear out. They just get really funky looking. Like, see all that crap there? Get a fresh charge on this. We'll attack that. I like using the white compound on these parts. When I'm buffing on the bench, on the uh, with the bench motor, with the six or eight inch buffing wheel, whatever's on that thing at the moment, I generally use the yellow compound because that's designed for nickel, and it brings it up really, really nice. But different kind of a polisher. Schmoo on there. This will come up. It might take a little work, but it will come up. I could take this to the bench motor and polish it that way. But I figure most people have a Dremel tool or have access to a Dremel tool. So I'd show you this way for this piece. Although I got to admit, I did the uh, presser bar and the needle bar earlier. I just took them to the bench motor. And I hit that up. Because this that would take forever to do those pieces with with a Dremel, but I have done it that way. It's very doable. See that's coming up. It's more compound on here. This is a. 320 grit scotch bright pad. And that's just cutting this crap right out. Rather than trying to do it with compound, do it with a scotch bright. Whoops. And that can happen. And if we get the majority of it off with the scotch bright, then we'll attack it with the. Uh, polishing compound to get it shiny. I don't want to give up on these parts because the replacement ones that are sold these days, the aftermarket um, tension discs have a slightly different shape than the original ones from back in the day. And I don't think the, the new ones work as well as the old ones do. Maybe I'm wrong. Your mileage may vary. That's been my experience. I don't. I just don't like it. I, well, it might be okay on this because this doesn't have a numbered dial, but on machines like a 201 or um, one of the 15 class that has a numbered dial on it or a 99 with a numbered dial or whatever, I don't like the way they work. I really prefer the original singer part. That's why whenever I see somebody selling original ones like that on eBay, I go ahead and I buy them, even, even if it's a little bit more money than I want to spend. Recently I bought, uh, somebody had upper tension mechanisms from four Model 128s in one lot on eBay. I just bought the whole, the whole batch. Okay. Okay, I got most of this thing cleaned up. Uh, I wanted to show you a little cute little trick on the presser foot. I've got a 400 on one side, 600 on the other um, nail file. So I'm going to start with the 400 grit on the bottom of the presser. That gets a lot of the schmoo off. All right, that cleans it up in a little bit. We're going to go to the 600 side.
That's getting much nicer looking. Now, we'll switch over to this one. Let's see, the black is 600, the white is 4,000. So we'll go to the white here. Take it up to 4,000 grit. And the flip side of this thing is 12,000. And we're going to put a drop of sewing machine oil on that. Oh, look at that. Look how nice and shiny that's getting. And you might think, well, why is he going through such a big deal? It's only a presser foot. Well, if the presser foot is smooth and shiny, it works better. Now, just a drop of oil on the 12,000 side. And we're rocking this so it gets all the bottom surfaces here. And we'll wipe that off with a rag. And look at that. We can do that because this one is a solid metal presser foot. And I still have to clean up in this area here. Which, hell, we can just, oops, take the 600 grit side. Just polish it with that. Clean it up. I think I mentioned earlier about smooth jawed uh, duckbill pliers. Here's a perfect excuse to have a pair because you can grab something without marring the surface and just get on there and polish that up a little bit. We don't have to make that super super shiny like we did the other side. Let me get all the surfaces up real nice. Get the inside because there was some goop on there. And one last pass on the bottom. Wipe it off. Oops. All right. Clean. Okay. Uh, we're getting ready to put this puppy back together again. So let me get reset. Okay. Getting her back together again. I put the stud back in and the spring. Sorry, I neglected to get that on camera. Now, this little bugger goes on here. And take my driver of screws, slap a magnet on it, and voila, it holds that screw on there real nice. goes in place. Now, a chunk of paper towel. Clean that and put a little, a little bit of oil on there, wipe off the excess. Get that in through the back only because that's going to make it easier. Now, disc, oopsie, <laughs> almost got it wrong. Disc, disc, pressure plate. I put it, I've got a new beehive spring for this. I don't like rusty springs and I didn't feel like sitting there and soaking it in evapo rust, so give it a fresh spring. That's not against the rules. And get the screw started. I should say nut, the adjusting nut started. Come on, adjusting nut. There we go. That's going on. We press that in from the back. And that is good. Now, inside, I might have to swing around the camera. See, see if you can see this or not. Let me take a quick peek if it's in the field. This might be difficult to see. It's hard to get enough light in there. With this little coil spring here that goes on and it clips just like that and you can see as it's coming up it'll work all right well we're going to worry about that a little differently in a minute we're going to get the needle bar in now the needle bar 
I polished the hell out of it on the buffer because it certainly needed it. So, let's first get the bearing out of our boxo parts. A little bit of oil inside the bearing. This cleaned up real nice in the ultrasonic, by the way. And that's going to go right on there. Slip it in place. And let's get the follower in place. And the follower is on. And we will drop correctly oriented the slot on the needle bar goes to the outside world. So we're going to get that down through the hole. Maneuver this around a little bit. Get that back in the slot. Okay, hold on. Here we go. This is a bit of a pain in the neck. Not nearly as much of a pain in the neck as this cat that just came in the room and wants to sit on my lap while I'm doing this. There we go. So that's down through, down through. Now our little spring popped out, but we'll deal with that in a minute. Now we've got to line up that hole. Roscoe P. Coltrane, you are a pain in the ass, cat. Okay, let me get out the appropriate screw, which is right. Oh, wrong bin. Roscoe, get down. All right. Get that lined up. Roscoe. You're making this difficult, cat. Okay, a little bit of a jump cut there. You see there's a little bit of up and down motion available with that screw just started. Because this is where you make the final adjustment of needle height needle bar height. I'm just going to get that in there like that. I'm going to cramp put that clamp down a little bit. All right. Oh, looky there. Isn't that pretty? Okay, I got the cat out of here. I'm not sneezing anymore. And let's get the Lift her arm in. Okay. That's in and working. All right. Now, the lifter block has to slide. Well, I, sorry, I stuck a magnet in there to get things out of my way. The lifter block's got to slide in into this slot in the side. Now, because this spring has got issues, what I'm going to do, normally the spring goes in from the top, but I'm not going to be able to do that with this one. So, I'm going to slide the spring down, I slide the thing down here, and let me get my little washer that's got to go in there too, because the washer wasn't fitting in. I'm going to put my little washer on. get the spring up. Normally this is not the sequence of events. Normally this all goes in from the top. But, seeing how that spring is not behaving, it's slightly bent, slightly deformed. But we got it in. So it's no big deal. And it's going to work. So, now, got to make a little minor adjustment and get that other spring in place. And if my head's in the way, I apologize. Pull that back. Get the little beehive spring that goes back on there. I might not be able to do this on camera, kids. I might have to, because I'm going to be in your way. So I'll show it to you when it's done. Okay. That little trauma has been taken care of. 
So now I gotta get the set screw back in on the presser bar. And we'll put that little screw in on the side as well. Let's get this one in first. Get her started. And we will adjust the height later. Definitely gonna have to adjust the height, but just to get it in for the moment. And just to make sure. Yep. The tension discs do loosen and they tighten and the spring works. All right. That's an IQ test to do that, by the way, guys. It's definitely an IQ test. All right. Now, to get a little bit more proof that it works, let's just put a little dab will do you oil. Ooh, way too much oil. Clean some of that excess off. And let's get some tension happening on the spring. Now, like I said, we'll adjust the height of the pressure foot later. See, they go floppy. They go tight. Floppy, tight. Floppy, tight. Okay, we're good there. Take up bar back in. Get it into the groove. And work its way back up. Which involves a little bit of jiggling. There we go. Got it up. And a little swerve. Come on, baby. You can do it. And come on. There we go. And it's in. And hold that in place. All right. We'll drop a oil in there too. There we go. Now she's back in sync. Okay. The hard part's done. Okay, I went ahead and I got the rest of this back together. There was nothing really super exciting, super difficult about it, but I do want to talk a little bit about some of the adjustments that need to be made. Uh, and some of the things to check. Now, um, I should mention, it's real easy to mess up and put the wrong screws in the wrong place, even though that looks like it might be the correct screw. Perfect example of that is these two, the two screws that hold the end piece on and the uh, needle plate screw. Those are the same thread, but they are definitely different screws. So this, this one up here for this cover plate is another one that can be easily confused. Um, you really do want to keep these separate and uh, keep track of where they are. Um, because if you put the wrong screw in the needle plate, you can't adjust the needle plate correctly. Now I'm going to take the bobbin out. I've already done some test sewing with this machine. I'm going to take the, well, I should say the shuttle and bobbin out uh, and point out a couple of things. Actually, I'm going to take the presser foot off as well. Real quick, just for point of interest here. Now, um, one thing the adjuster's manual points out is when the needle, let me see if I can zoom in on that a little bit. When the needle goes down and it enters the uh, needle plate, you're not looking for the needle to be directly in the middle. Au contraire, it doesn't want that at all. Here's a case where you really want to take a look at the adjuster's manual. The needle is going to be entering slightly to the right of the center of the hole. Actually, pretty close to the edge of the hole. So that's one thing you want to check. Um, 
you can make a minor amount of adjustment by tweaking the needle plate. But you can't do that if you put the wrong screw in. Right now it's set correctly. Another thing is the position. We'll put the presser foot back on. Where the presser foot sits versus the needle hole. You want that needle hole to be pretty much dead nut center of the presser foot. But that's kind of common sense. We kind of figured that already. So let me pull this back off. Needle bar height. There is two screws to adjust. And we saw when we disassembled, there was the clamping screw and the center screw. Needle bar height is determined with all these plates off and a shuttle in place. Um, once again, you really want the adjuster's manual, and this, this plate has to be off as well. You really want the adjuster's manual so you can see that. I'm hoping that the lighting today is better than it was yesterday when I was shooting. I was reviewing my footage last night and I was like, oh no, I can't start from scratch because I've already cleaned this thing. Um, let's take a look at some of the adjustments on the bottom. Okay, bottom of the machine. As you recall, this machine was really filthy underneath and I wound up taking everything out to clean it. Now, when you put it back together again, you're going to have to make a couple of adjustments. Now, on this side of the machine and on this side of the machine, you'll see this. It's a nut around a screw that is tapered to a point. It's like a pivot screw. And what these screws control are the lateral position, the left to right position of the feed dogs inside the needle plate. So your first adjustment would be to get the needle correctly oriented in the needle plate. Then you would adjust the height of the feed dogs, which the height of the feed dogs is adjust with, adjusted with this screw here. You want 7 eighths of the height of the feed dog exposed above the needle plate. How do you measure 7 eighths? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> you can sit there and you can you can use feeler gauges and measure it. I do it by feel. Uh, I do it by eye to a degree. Um, but the adjuster's manual calls for 7 eighths of the height of the teeth in the feed dog extending above the height of the needle plate. Anyway, so you get, your, you get your, your, your needle position adjusted, you get the uh, depth of the needle adjusted, and then when, and the feed dogs uh, height adjust, then you loosen these end nuts and you tighten one, loosen the other, back and forth, until you've got the feed dogs laterally, side to side, adjusted to the center of the needle plate. Now, fore and aft adjustment of the feed dogs, and yes, that's a thing because you can find that the feed dogs will bang up against the back of the needle plate or bang up against the front of the needle plate, is done here. This bolt going through is actually an eccentric. It's an off-center bolt. So, and this is the clamping screw that holds it tight. So you adjust this bolt, turning it either way to move the feed dogs fore and aft, which is gonna be a little bit of trial and error, spinning the, spinning the hand wheel, watching the position of the feed dogs in the needle plate. When you got it where you want it, you crank on down on the uh, clamping bolt. Now, if you're, if you're shuttle timing, not the, the timing on this machine is controlled by the shuttle more so than by the needle. The needle, the height of the needle bar is part of it, but uh, hook timing as you would do in, an, in a uh, rotary hook or an oscillating hook machine, the equivalent of that is shuttle timing. The bolt here that's going through is, um, it's a hollow bolt that a screw goes into. That hollow bolt is on an eccentric going into this arm. So, like everything else, there's a timing mark up here where the shuttle has to be, and you would loosen, turn it, clamp it tight, 
double check, double check, double check. This is why I can't stress enough the importance of having the adjuster's manual. I could put up a screen full of specs, but it's not going to help you. You really need to get to download the manual. Now, I know the Facebook group for Singer 127 Sewing Machines has the adjuster's manual for the 27. I believe the Sewing Machine Resource Center group has it as well. Uh, Mark Sumter's group on Facebook, which has a multitude of manuals on it. Anyway, those are the biggies. I'm going to put her back upright and we'll take a look at the bobbin winder adjustments. I don't know why, but these bobbin winders seem to give a lot of people a lot of trouble for adjusting. They shouldn't. They're very, very simple if you take the time before you take it apart to learn how it works, to pay attention how the mechanism works, and you might want to take a couple of pictures with, of it with your phone just so you have a reference when you're reassembling. Now normally, let me get this thing into a starting position, when you go to wind a bobbin, you want it all the way to the right. You'll notice this heart-shaped piece here is actually a cam. The large gear behind it engages with the worm gear when the bobbin winder tire is engaged with the hand wheel. It's really simple in operation. There's only one spring and that's the spring for the, for the thread guide which has the cam follower which follows that heart-shaped cam. It will just go back and forth all day long quite happily of course it's going to not be happy, it's going to disengage from the wheel. There we go. It will go back and forth all day long, winding bobbins just like that. That's a new bobbin tire, so I kind of have to scuff that up a little bit to make this work correctly. Anyway, when reassembling these, what you have to remember is this center bolt, once again, is actually an eccentric. There's a nut behind there, so you want to and uh, adjust the engagement of this gear into the worm gear. You don't want it tight. You want it t just tight, just enough contact so that this big gear turns when you turn the worm. If it's too tight, you'll damage this gear. You'll definitely, you can definitely damage that gear and that you do not want to do. Everything else is pretty straightforward. Like I said, there's only one spring. It's a coil spring that has a little prong that goes out. There's three holes on the back of this, uh, on the back of the arm here, where one goes in, goes around a center shaft. It hooks onto the uh, onto the onto the uh, thread guide arm, and it just the cam follower just follows that cam. Really, really simple in operation. And once you've cleaned and rebuilt one or two of these it becomes easy as pie. I'm not a big fan of doing these on 66s or 15s. The mechanism's a little bit different, but on the 127, 128, 27, 28, whatever, on these long bobbin machines, it's real easy. Okay, that about does it for this machine. I still have a little bit of uh, polishing to do to get my greasy fingerprints off of it before I ship it. But I just thought I'd end off with making a few stitches.